So this campus exists only for graduate level students and it exists only for students that want to study international economics, international environmental law, international peace and security, um, international relations, etc. Reach out and speak to different students that you see here on campus. So the issues that you guys are studying are the exact same issues that many of the students are studying here and we really want you guys to, to make the most of being in this place. You're not just debating here because this is just a place where you can debate. You're debating here because this is a place where the students that are very interested in these topics come. We should have yes. mandatory minimum jail time for dealing right. with fentanyl. We're from the Bay Area. We have a debate conference in the Morsi building, I believe. We're uh, debating on opioids. There's uh, increasing FDA regulations on releasing things like oxycodone. What grade and then there's talks about. Uh, I'm like in middle seven. I'm in sixth grade. Wow, that's not what I was doing in sixth grade. <laughs> that's impressive. Yeah. Study Russian as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. advanced. 18 nice. years. I started in South Carolina. My name is uh, John Kennedy and I'm representing the great state of Louisiana. Welcome delegates uh, to the United States Senate. I'm sure you're familiar with parliamentary procedure. However, if you have any questions throughout the debate, please let me know um, and I'll be happy to, happy to help you. My name is Stephanie Jackson. I'll be your head chair. I'm Audrey Klein, co-chairing. Um, motion to open debate. That motion is in order. Are there any other points or motions on the floor at this time? This motion passes. So a policy round basically means that you're going to state your policy on a few of the topics that we're going to be talking about. Drugs that should not be getting through transportation centers and things like that are better detected. And my biggest concern is how, I would say, corrupt the big pharma industry is. To solve the opioid crisis, it's necessary to cut off the suppliers. Um, such as China or Mexico, and that we should not enforce the death penalty, but rather try to reform the way people think about drugs. This opioid crisis has gone on far too long, and too many people, not just in the U.S. as a whole, but of my native Tennesseans, have died from opioid addiction and abuse. Thousands have died from opioids in general, and hundreds from fentanyl alone, and I believe that these distributors of fentanyl, regardless of the amount that they're distributing, should be held for, behind bars for much longer. Um, I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with the um, using the death penalty on drug dealers in certain situations. Next up, we have the motion for a moderated caucus uh, by Senator Baldwin on the death penalty for dealers um, for eight minutes with a 45 second speaking time. All those in favor of this moderated caucus, please raise your placards now, raise your pine. Uh, this motion passes. Why should we be trying to encourage less drug taking by killing people if our goal is, is to let not have dead people? If you can stop all those deaths by killing this one person, then you should. They can have a longer jail sentence or even a life sentence, but they don't deserve to die. We're here to protect the American citizens that are not killing other people. They may be going through hard times too. They may have a mental illness. They may be going through depression. It is not fair for them to receive the death penalty. The only punishment that receives the death penalty is first degree murder, which is premeditated, carefully, methodically planned out murder. Drugs are not intentionally killing. Opioids specifically are meant to help cease pain, chronic pain. Even though uh, death can be an effect of the opioids, it is not, people are not taking the drugs to die. The sellers are, the sellers are not taking the drugs to die. They're taking them because they're either addicted or needed for chronic pain. Minimum. That motion passes. Right now in our country today, uh, people uh, who deal with fentanyl are getting lower sentences than, uh, than ones uh, who uh, deal in heroin. Every single scenario is different. Every single one. And we cannot create one minimum that would encompass every single situation, no matter how small or no matter how big it is. So as of right now, the current policy stands in the Controlled Substances Act as a minimum um, amount of grams uh, for someone who uh, will be um, indicted um, as um, uh, containing uh, fentanyl is 400 grams of a substance that has fentanyl and 100 grams of fentanyl, any analog of, uh, any analog of fentanyl. Nonetheless, Congress has swung in most recent times 
towards lowering mandatory minimums for other drugs. Congress did pass a piece of legislation that said, okay, the U.S. Postal Service, um, we want you to be more strict with monitoring. Um, nonetheless, that has not been implemented yet. In this debate, I highly suggest that we focus on both China and the big pharmaceutical companies in order to um, ensure that the opioid crisis stops. Esteemed delegates, the reason people take opioids now are because they're addicted or they need it, and it's the only option. But if we have a safer, less addictive drug, people are definitely going to want to take it instead of the dangerous opioids. So we should definitely fund research to help that happen. I think we're going to focus on finding alternative medication, and I would recommend that to be cannabis. I think it has many um, medical advantages and medical benefits. And it is not nearly close to the potency of fentanyl and is not as potent as opioids. I think it's very important, as you said, to make sure that the money we are taking from the pharmaceutical companies because they because they are putting out these drugs and not necessarily stating what those drugs will do should be used for different public education and rehabilitation centers. So we should impose sanctions on China um, and Mexico just in for drug manufacturers who knowingly provide synthetic opioids um, to, especially to people in the United States. Um, I think that this would be the most effective way to get the Chinese government to actually um, work harder to enforce the laws and regulations that they have promised to enforce. We should not impose excessive uh, sanctions because we don't want to worsen our relationship with China. China has continuously used our country for their economic gain. There are over, as I said earlier, 160,000 chemical producing opioid companies in China, and over 60% of the world's fentanyl in 2018 was also produced in China. Steam centers, being a public school teacher for 13 years, I think I have quite the necessary experience when it comes to public education. And let me tell you, there's no reason why any child in America should have to grow up in a school that experiences violence every day, specifically with opioids. We must stop them by educating the new generations. Thank you. And it, studies have shown that kids are more likely to get addicted than adults. And if we educate them sooner in life, then they won't have the chance to get addicted later. It is very, very common and very, very tempting, Ernst, that we come up with these solutions that are extremely vague, that you create subcommittee after subcommittee to deal with the problems that this subcommittee is supposed to deal with. And it's very tempting to do that, especially if you're becoming a bit more lethargic, you really don't want to put the work into it, and I totally understand that, but really know that I'm looking for solutions, and for delegates who are looking for solutions that are detailed and organized and well thought out, because the opioid crisis is something that is extremely pressing and is probably going to affect you and has affected the people that you know for many, many years. We are not trying to completely ban opioids. We are trying to limit them so they aren't being abused. Why do we have to ask China to stop making fentanyl if we can simply stop fentanyl from coming in by increasing border security and increasing the strength as well as the sensitivity of our detectors in the United States Postal Service? No, look, for you. options for MITs and other things or less addictive painkillers that need to be passed. And I think that um, we need to make sure that people are safe and give out uh, neolaxone kits and things like that. Thing. Uh, we need to fund uh, opioid reco uh, recovery centers and uh, mental professionals to treat people in recovery to prevent uh, further relapses and overdose. Take the opioid crisis as, is, as a disease and not as an issue of the people. We shouldn't be creating safe spaces or anything of the like for using drugs. People don't just decide to use opioids because there's a place to use opioids. So buprenorphine and um, uh, methadone are the two that basically will help you get over an addiction and they don't necessarily so much as stop the high as give you sort of that same feeling, but at a lower level. So you can kind of like ease off. Transition. Of the transition off of your addiction. I have given you lots of time 
and lots of unmoderated caucuses, and I would like to start seeing legislation presented after this one. So, I, I believe that reaching out through education, especially through the public school system, to help educate about drugs is most important, especially not just educating them in high school or when they might already get addicted to drugs, but to educate them in, say, middle school or younger, so they they already know that these are drugs that, they, that could possibly ruin their entire lives. This bill will make sure that people are educated during the sixth grade, so it's during middle school when drugs are are sometimes first really introduced into their lives. Fund some sort of research investigation where we find which companies have led to the most deaths by overdoses and misuses. And we need to look into that and we need to see if there was any chance that they could have been uh, knowingly <coughs> wrongdoing or ignoring something or doing anything wrong where they could have saved these lives. But we also need to be careful not to accuse anybody wrongly. The policy director, I will remind you all that politics plays a crucial role in the Senate at all times. So maintaining friendships and alliances is super important and respecting people every single moment you are in a debate. All senators in favor of a seven minute unmoderated caucus, please raise your placards now. This motion clearly passes. Please use this time wisely to work on That's legislation. An example of Purdue Pharma, they're spending she billions of dollars trying to cover up what Richard Sackler said. But the, um, but the cost of yeah. the medication should never change, but they should all be able to have to free market their product. That should be the, exactly. the entirety of the bill. Yeah. 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 Okay. No, we will now vote on the criminal penalty bill. All in and favor, please raise your placards now. No, 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 no. All opposed? All abstention. You can't vote that. But this oh, bill is your Allocates $100,000 to create an online program and um, intended to educate healthcare professionals on the topic of opioids, their harmful effects, and different ways to combat them or treat the, treat the patients. First responders, nurses, and doctors must all take this course. So could you explain what the uh, website or the online program uh, would be, would it be like different doctors or speakers it, explaining, would it just be one website? It would be, just as you said, it would be different doctors and speakers explaining uh, explaining what uh, opioids do, and then afterwards you take a test and you'd have to get a sort Yeah, thank you. We are now in voting procedure. Please do not enter or exit the room. All in favor of the Equipping Healthcare Professionals Bill of 2019, please raise your placards now. This bill clearly passes. Unanimously. Uh, this bill is extremely short but effective. It uh, establishes a pilot program, which uh, which basically is a t uh, testing to establish uh, needle exchanges and also public rehabilitation centers for people who cannot afford to go to the extremely expensive rehabilitation centers that are open right now. All in favor of the pilot program bill, Everyone. please raise your placards now. Oh this bill clearly passes. At any time you rise, it's either a motion or a point. So the chair will ask you, to what point or motion you rise? You rise, fully rise before you speak, and say motion for a or point of inquiry, and then the chair says on that point, and then you reply with your point. We have worked very hard on creating many bills that are bipartisan and effective. But now we come to the uh, to the biggest problem of all, uh, presenting this to the uh, bigger audience. And now it is time to decide which ones will be voted, and then go on to the House, and then go on to the President, and then if that's vetoed, it will go on to the Senate. So anyway, it's a big deal now. Let's start with the judiciary, and then go on to the FDA. We're going to start with the fentanyl subcommittee bills. Uh, this bill, as you can see up here, uh, it's to basically stop fentanyl and other lethal drugs from coming in from China. What we will be doing is allocating $10 million to the United States Postal Service uh, to be used as followed. Uh, the United States Postal Service will collect advanced electronic data on 100% of packages. Right now, it's currently at 36%. So this mandatory minimum resolution lowers the mandatory minimum bar fentanyl. So right now, it's uh, 400 grams of fentanyl mixture is the bar, and we want to lower it to 10 grams of fentanyl mixture. And for pure fentanyl, it's 
Uh, we want to lower to 0 0.03. Well, uh, we want to uh, punish the um, the pharmaceutical companies uh, that have wronged our citizens. We are focusing on uh, fighting and punishing uh, capitalists in America. No, they have knowingly uh, um, uh, killed and uh, debilitated thousands of Americans. Sponsors of the public education bill, please come to the This bill will just make sure that education of drugs will be given to all students in the public education. This clause allocates hundred thousand dollars to create an online program intended to educate healthcare professionals on the topic of opioids and how to treat the patient who has an issue. Collins. Um, why do you just have an online course, not an actual physical course? We'll also make sure that these people get the right amount of information and not cost as much for the people that are have to take it and won't take as much time out of their busy schedules. We're going to compile all of these resolutions into a document for you all. We're going to email them to you all. If anyone has any issue not being able to receive it electronically, we can print them out. Please review them tonight so that tomorrow when we come back for the full session, if you were not in the health or the judiciary, you understand what work went on. Um, some of you have been doing conferences for many, many times. Maybe this is even your fifth conference. Some of you, this may be your second or even your first. And I'll tell you now that even those confident delegates are still gonna be nervous, like coming into the future when going into speeches, when going into conferences, and that's totally okay to be nervous. It took me three years to get over my fear of public speaking. One of the things that helped me is one, LCM, and two, practice. So if you're someone that like isn't necessarily like one extreme or the other, you can definitely still work and actually be the key linchpin to the debate today because you're the person that's going to bring everyone in the room together and focus on the details. Um, so I'd say don't be afraid to like make a speech just because you're representing someone that's more moderate in this topic. This motion passes. We are now in a five minute moderate, moderate caucus. They're saying speaking time on moderate, uh, on mandatory minimums. So when we are talking about mandatory minimums, we're talking about raising the punishment for pushing a deadly drug through our communities. If we lower it too much, then we can result in over jailing, which will cost our taxpayers a lot of money. Somebody sells fentanyl and it kills one person. They get the same punishment as if Somebody sells fentanyl and it kills 20 of the What we have with mandatory minimums is simply an incentive. Right now, 100 grams of just pure fentanyl, 100 grams, any less will not get you more than 15 years in prison, which is unacceptable, considering that can kill multiple people, and overdoses do happen with fentanyl. We have to meet them halfway, and we have to help provide safety for drug users as well, rather than just jailing people who are dealing, because people, it won't stop people from dying. Senators, what this bill would do is allocate $10 million to the United States Postal Service to be used, as you can see up there, so the United States Postal Service would collect advanced electronic data on 100% of international packages. Currently, it's at about 36%. It will also hire 46 new narcotics field agents to help stop the flow of fentanyl into the country. I would think that 46 new field agents would be rather ineffective in a national organization. How are they going to collect this data? What are they going to collect the data on? This bill needs to be specified much further. What are the field agents' jobs going to specifically be? I'm afraid I cannot vote for this bill until I see more detail on it. This is the exact amount that the Postmaster General actually asked for. We've done our research. We understand that this money will be going to stopping drugs from coming into China. 68% of all fentanyl that comes into the United States comes through packages. All those in favor of the stop whole secret uh, ballot vote, please raise your placards now. That's unanimous, so it's passive. There's a drug I'm sure that you all read about in the briefing called naloxone, which counteracts fentanyl so, and opioids. So if someone accidentally or takes an overdose, they will be able to have the ability with every prescription we are requiring that this is given, That's therefore to ensure that the lives um, of our citizens are protected when they do use opioids. Now we all know that 87% of overdoses are accidental, so if people go to these mats 
they are saving lots of lives. If this, if the smaller individuals are willing to give information that can hopefully track down the larger, more raw distributors, then why not give them a reward? The issue with this is that it targets minority groups. Um, African Americans in the United States go to prison and are incarcerated five to seven more times than whites on a drug-related sentence. Therefore, mandatory minimums without the use of a judge, as you guys just stated, uh, stated a couple of speeches ago, um, creates mandatory minimums as a new form of segregation in the United States. Senator Grassley, Cotton, Cash, Blackburn, and Graham up at the front. This bill lowers the mandatory minimum for fentanyl, so um, it's going to be uh, 10 grams of fentanyl mixture and 0.03 grams or 30 milligrams of pure fentanyl, which is the lethal amount. How much prison time would that much be? So it actually amends um, a previous bill that states that uh, 400 grams of a fentanyl mixture would trigger mandatory minimums, and that would be 10 years to life. On the 17-1 on MMR, all those in favor, please raise your flags now. Everyone must vote. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That motion passes. I believe that the Republican Party having nine um, against six and having Kamala Harris is absent. We need to table this debate as nothing can get done for the Democratic Party. Um, and it, everything and the simple majority is for the Republican Party. I do not believe that the Democratic Party would full on give up if they didn't no. have the full on majority. There's been many times in history where the Republican Party had over two thirds of the seats in the Senate, and yet the Democratic Party did not walk out on the Senate. They continued to speak and whatnot and participate in debate. And this single sided bill, and then it moves on to the next committee where you don't have two thirds majority, then you aren't going to be receiving any Democrat big votes. And let's say that by some miracle you pass that. Then the bill moves on to the House. And who has control of the House? The Democrats. So, if you ever want this bill to become law, you gotta make it bipartisan. You need to work with both parties. It is not okay to have a single sided bill. motion for a 9 minute 30 second speaking time lottery caucus to discuss the reforming FDA bill. Um, 75% of the FDA is controlled by pharmaceuticals and by having the government fight it, then it will be done. We need to take our time to make sure that these drugs are completely safe, that these drugs are non-addictive, so that there's no more harm to the already much harmed American population. Also, clause one, how can you just give the commissioner uh, the power to reject the people? This is not, this is not uh, giving too much power to the commissioner. We're completely up our government in clause one and two. Thank you. Uh, in the process of a uh, unfriendly amendment, what happens is, since it has been introduced, now we will vote on it. It requires a two-thirds majority, which is 20 delegates, to approve it. All those in favor of striking clause two of this bill, please raise your placard. Okay, All right. so, 13. All those opposed. This does not pass. So, uh, two is staying. And all those in favor of a six-minute, 30 seconds speaking time moderating caucus on the PPP. It provides support to those who are trying to get over their addiction, make sure that people get safe needles, and it, uh, it's also a pilot program, so it will be able to be changed after after the time is up. Remember what policy you're representing, and I would also say that even a lot of Democrats that are more moderate might not automatically jump to needle exchanges and a pilot program for this program. Thank As a government, we cannot say that we disapprove of drugs but then approve of needle exchanges. Because needle exchanges are tools to use drugs. Needle exchanges will not encourage random people that want to feel some sort of high just because they feel a sense of security. My home state of Louisiana is one of the highest, has one of the highest rates of opioid addiction. And I 
that but every resident there appreciates this bill. This immediately crack down on the dealers who are destroying the society. This bill is less about incentivizing um, drug dealers to um, no longer deal fentanyl. It is more about keeping these dealers off of the streets and by proxy keeping fentanyl out of the hands of Americans. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 17. So that would mean that this unfriendly amendment passes. We are going to begin with our closing ceremonies. Delegates were selected specifically by their chairs for aspects of leadership, but also negotiation, caring, kindness, who works behind the scenes, and how closely you stay behind policy. Uh, whether you're a moderate or a more extreme position. So for all of those traits, that's the reason those delegates were selected to speak. You have the ability to improve no matter what your skill set is. And you are gifted with the power of your voice because there are hundreds of thousands of millions of people who are not gifted with a voice, who are silenced, who are voiceless due to their age, due to their gender, due to their religion, or whatnot. And you, sitting in this room, are extremely privileged and gifted that you are able to get up to a podium and speak about the opioid crisis and speak about geoengineering or climate change or whatnot. And that is something that you should take with you, not to feel burdened or guilty or whatnot, but to feel empowered. There's a wide range of ide ideology in this committee, and we all had to work together to pass legislation that actually worked. This was a vital aspect of the debate, and I saw many examples of it in my committee and within myself. And I think if we learned this skill and mastered it, we would be able to continue to be productive. For cooperation, I want to make sure that every solution I find addresses many points of view in the room, rather than just ones like my own. I personally look at diplomacy um, and the definition of diplomacy more to be respect for respect. If you respect someone, they're going to respect you back. And this can be a very powerful skill, especially in debate. Speaking consistently is a perfect way to add to the debate. Keep your agenda in the conversation, and most importantly, improve your public speaking skills. If you uh, speak consistently and confidently, people uh, will look to you as a leader uh, and, uh, and someone knowledgeable in the topic. One thing that motivates me is the debate topic. Each research topic, whether about detention facilities in Nauru, Australia, or the opioid crisis in the USA, is individually captivating. I learn something new every time. These topics inspire me to keep researching and learn about the topic even after the debate. It was such a gratifying experience to come up with bills that could potentially save lives and to talk to you today. You learn as you go along. You recognize, improvise, and you empathize with the delegates that you're working with. Everyone contributes in one way or another. From bill writers to fort writers, everyone's voice matters, and all votes count unless you aren't in the room when we um, move into the room. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd like to thank Katarina, especially, Olivia, John, Kellen, and especially my fellow chair, Stephanie, for being such amazing role models and so very supportive of my time here today.